Hello everyone. Um, we're going to be doing our third video. What I'm going to be talking about today is DNS. And DNS is a very important part of the internet. A lot of people don't really understand how it works. What I'm going to go for today is simply this. For the first part of the video, I'm going to be talking primarily about DNS itself. This will apply to uh, anyone on any operating system. Um, what we are eventually going to go for, though, is we will install our own caching DNS server in a FreeBSD jail inside of FreeNAS. Now, if that part doesn't interest you, that's fine. I will try to uh, make this as agnostic as possible on various operating systems until we get to that last part. Okay, so first of all, what is DNS? So what I've got set up here, I've got 25,000 virtual machines sort of set up where I have all of these things demonstrated for you. Let us just go ahead and dig right in uh, <clears throat> to some examples of how this is going to work. Okay, so what I have here, this is a Windows 10 virtual machine. I have loaded uh, www.ebay.com. Now, what I want to point out to you is when you put a host name in your browser, there's actually something else going on there. Uh, to some extent, there is no such thing as eBay.com. This doesn't really exist. When you send, and what I mean by that is this, when you send an internet packet out there to the universe, there is no way to send it to eBay.com. That concept doesn't even exist. The only destinations in the internet protocol are IP addresses. You know, things like 192.168.1.1, uh, when you configure your router that you might be familiar with. So those are really the only destinations on the internet. So when you type something like this, before anything can happen here, a service has to come in and it has to convert this to an internet address for you, okay? And this all happens under the covers. Now, how does your computer know how to do that, okay? The answer to that is when you start your internet connection, you know, when you connect to your router, or whatever it is you're going to do, generally speaking, you are given an IP address from your router through a protocol called DHCP. Also, what happens during that exchange is DHCP will also inform you of DNS servers that you can use. DNS servers are servers whose only job is to provide to you DNS answers. It's not done by your computer. Generally speaking, it's not done by your router unless you're a, a big power user. Uh, rather, those are services generally provided by your internet service provider that will provide this information for you, okay? So let's talk about how this actually works. What I have in this window is something called Wireshark. Wireshark is sort of the ultimate uh, basic tool for a guy that wants to look at network traffic as it exists in its raw state. Okay, and I had this running. Uh, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let me clear this. I had this uh, running when I went to that eBay page. And I want to show you what was involved here. These are all of the packets. Look how many, this is just to load the eBay front page, okay? All of these packets came through just to load that page, okay? Now what I want to point out to you about what we're seeing here, uh, this is where right here, packet nine is where I said, go ahead to eBay.com. You will see the very first thing that happened before anything else happened. The very first thing that happened is that a packet was sent from this virtual machine, which is at this IP address, to this IP address, which happens to be my DNS server that I run. Okay? And the very first thing it said is, look at this. What the hell is www.ebay.com? Okay? So that question was asked, and you'll see about 20, was that 20? 20, 18, 18 milliseconds later. I hope I added that right. 18 milliseconds later, an answer came. You see, query number alpha812 is answered on this line. And the answer is, okay, you asked what eBay.com is? Well, eBay.com is the same as this. 
And this happens to be this IP address. So now what are you going to see on the next line? Remember these numbers here, right? This is 66.135.210.181. Look at this. 66.135.210.181. And you can see here that this uh, classic triple TCP handshake is what starts the web download. Um, the web, the, the TCP connection where you're going to download the web page from the eBay server. Okay. Now that's not the full story. If you look down here, look, there's more DNS. All right. And as you go through this, this list of packets, you're going to find a whole bunch of these light blue DNS packets here. Now what's happening? Let me go ahead and filter those out for you. So we're only looking at those DNS packets. DNS is typically on port 53, by the way. Okay. So if I go ahead and I filter it up, every transaction that you see here, was necessary to load the eBay front page, okay? And this is typical for any kind of a website that you're going to go to. Look how many of these guys there were. There's just an astronomical number of DNS queries. This is all I did. All I did was I went to eBay, and this page after page after page of DNS queries had to be resolved. Look how many of these there are. Sometimes there are so many of these queries. Look at this. Here are one, two, three, four, five, six queries. Six queries are asked before the first one is even answered. In fact, that's not even. This answer right here goes all the way with this. Notice those serial numbers here, right? So all of these queries are necessary. These load your ads, these load your images, these load all kinds of other things. And the important thing to think about is nothing is happening on your web page download until the DNS queries are resolved because there is no way to get the information from the web until the DNS answers with the IP addresses that you're going to need to load the various elements. Okay, that's why it's very, it doesn't matter if you have, have gigabit ethernet uh, to, the, to the WAN, that doesn't matter. Uh, you can't use any of that speed until these queries get resolved. So you are always waiting on these queries. And that is why having a high-performance DNS server available to you can be very useful. Okay, so hopefully I've impressed you with, with how important DNS is. And everything waits for all these DNS queries to resolve. Okay, and the service that resolves them is called a DNS server. Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit about how you can play with DNS queries directly. Okay, so one of these various, uh, okay, this will be fine. Uh, let me just tell you what the setup is here first. I have already done some things. I have already set up a free NAS jail. I have already done um, port snap fetch extract. Okay, I've already done that in here. These things take some time. I didn't want you to be sitting there while I did them. So this has all been set up. I've configured the SSH daemon to accept my uh, to accept my terminal here. Uh, if you don't know how to do that, go to one of my earlier videos, for example, the own cloud video that I made last month. And in there, I, I actually go through this specific setup so you can see how I prepare the jails for this. But let's just take this as granted. When you are in any kind of a command line interface, and this, this doesn't matter if it's Mac or, or Windows or one of the 493,000 versions of Linux or one of the BSDs, you can always type NSLOOKUP. And NSLOOKUP is the uh, uh, name server lookup where you can just manually do DNS queries if you ever had a need to do that. Okay? And so this is a very simple thing. If you go and you type server, uh, it will tell you what IP address uh, is being used to resolve your queries. Okay, what I've got here, 192.168.159.2, that is something that uh, the virtual machine has put into intercept DNS queries. Now, you can change it to whatever you want. Famously, Google has a DNS server at 8888, so I could just manually switch it to that. And now when I do queries, it's going to resolve there. So, for example... Notice I put a dot at the end. Little known fact, uh, these domain names that you type in, they're actually supposed to have a dot at the end, um, but for so long we haven't done it that it is uh, no longer, you know, something that people know about. But when you use NSLOOKUP on certain systems, 
probably not on this one, but on certain systems, you will need that trailing dot. So go ahead and do this. Uh, you can see that you get uh, a whole bunch of, of interesting information. And finally here at the bottom, whoops, your PC needs to restart. I don't think so, brother. Eight hours will be fine. Where was I? Uh, you can see that a whole bunch of interesting information is returned, okay? I've asked for eBay.com. It's Let me just interpret what this is saying for you. Uh, the DNS server gave a number of responses. The first one is eBay.com. Well, I'm not going to give you the IP address for it, but I'm going to tell you that it will be the same IP address that you're going to get for this. And now you can see we've looked up this. Well, it says I'm not going to tell you what the IP address is, but it will be the same as what you get for this. And then one more time, same deal. And then finally, this Akamai server resolves to this IP address. Okay? And so you can do this with, with anything you want to do. IBM.com. Same deal. Okay? Um, the math department at Duke University. Okay, same deal. Very So this one's very simple, of course. Okay? So that's how NSLOOKUP works. It gives you uh, basic information. Now, you can get far more um, interesting power user information by using the domain Internet uh, Broker, I think it stands for. Domain? I don't even remember. DIG stands for something. The syntax for it is DIG, the at sign on the server that you would like to do the DNS queries through. Okay? And the guy that you would like to resolve. Now, this gives you a number of very, very interesting pieces of information. Uh, a little bit more. You can read about what all of this is if you read the RFCs on how the DNS protocol was set up. It's actually very interesting. I'm not going to uh, tell you much about these, but they are very interesting. There's a clever little um, compression scheme that actually can be used with, uh, in DNS lookups, which is also interesting. So if you start reading about that, you'll learn about it. Uh, but you can see here with DIG, you get a bit more information, including the amount of time that it took to get the answer. Okay. Uh, I'll show you something a little bit interesting. This is my uh, DNS. Is this my DNS server? That's my DNS server. Uh, if I go ahead and let's let's say I look up Alaska.de. Okay. Now I'm going to do the same thing again. Now I want you to look at one thing here that is very interesting. This re recursive query took a third of a second. Okay. The next time I ask for the same piece of information, notice that it only took three milliseconds. Okay. And let me just take pause for a moment and explain to you what is going on there, because that's really the crux of what we're going to do in the second part of this video. Going out to some internet server like the Google DNS or, or what have you takes some time. That server is out there somewhere in the universe. You have to make a connection to it. That server has to do its lookup. It has to return it to you. All of that jazz has to be done. Uh, that can take anywhere from, you know, if you have a good DNS uh, recursor that you're using out there, that can take between 50 milliseconds and 500 milliseconds. So this number that we got of, of what was it, 300 something, 349, that's not terribly unusual, okay? But, okay, and this is the very interesting part. If you have a DNS caching server running on your end, the beauty of this is that this question, if it is ever asked again, will already be known. The answer will be known because you've already asked and your server, should you choose to run one, will remember it. Okay? And so what happened the first time I went out there, uh, my DNS server didn't know the answer, so it went in and asked a higher authority out there on the Internet. And that took 349 milliseconds. The second time I asked for it, my server did know the answer, and it returned it immediately. So it was only three milliseconds, okay? So imagine you're loading web pages and you have to pause for 349 milliseconds to get a DNS answer. 20, 30, 40 times, as you saw over on the, um, over here on the eBay thing. Or these queries will take three milliseconds. Now, 
I can guarantee you that your internet experience is going to be better as many times as you can have a cached answer like this. Okay. Now you might be wondering, uh, you know, how long are these answers good for? So if you're familiar with how caches work, at some point information in the cache should be considered stale. Uh, in which case you should go and you should refetch the information. This is pretty standard stuff. DNS has this question built in. When you inform the uh, Internet servers at large out there uh, about your particular DNS resolution, you also tell them how long of a period of time in seconds that that answer will be good for. So, for example, if you run a very, very stable your IP addresses don't change much, you know, you know, let's say, for example, you're that Duke University math department. Your IP address, it's probably the same IP address that they had back when I was in grad school, you know, 10 years ago. Um, that doesn't change much. So you can say these answers that I give are good for a whole day. And then for a whole day, anybody that asks for that Duke.edu address that you ask for will be able to get a cached answer. Okay. But if you have another situation, for example, you're eBay and you're, and you're constantly uh, changing uh, which servers are answering your queries because you have load balancing and you have all this other jazz going on, well, then you might want to say, you know what, let's make that five minutes. Okay. And then some people out there, uh, like the University of Buffalo, for some reason that only they know, they have said their answers are good for zero seconds. So every time you ask for them, uh, a fresh answer has to be fetched. Okay, But most of the time, uh, people will have uh, several minutes or several hours of permanence on their DNS queries. And you can remember all of those queries and you can use them. Okay, So this is basically how you can look up uh, various DNS um, various DNS addresses manually if you ever needed to. Now, what do you use for a DNS server? You know, what server do you use to get your authoritative answers? Well, there are quite a few of them out there. And uh, let me see if I can find them. By the way, I'm sorry. You know, I've got the left side of the screen cut off here on the recording. So I'm sorry if you didn't get to see it all there. I'll move it over for you. Um, let's see if I have it. To, to, to public DNS server list. If you take a look at this, so this is public-dns.tk. Um, this is an extremely large collection of DNS server addresses by country. So you know, if you're uh, you're sitting up there in Norway, these are the various DNS servers that are in Norway, and you can see. Well, there's a lot. Here's some IPv6 one, but you can see here some familiar IPv4 addresses, and uh, you can. If you're in Norway, then one would presume that these are fast uh, DNS services that you can use. And, you know, they are run by, you know, you can sort of get an idea of who is running them by looking at this information. Okay. So you can do this and you can choose one that's close to you or, uh, or you can do something a little bit more fancy. This is Steve Gibson's website, uh, grc.com. Opinions vary on Steve Gibson. I personally think that if there's a topic you don't know much about, that Steve Gibson can definitely, uh, a lot of the things he offers will definitely get you started. Okay. If you go to his website here and you go under freeware, utilities, you'll see this uh, guy, DNS Benchmark. DNS Benchmark is a, um, a little thing that uh, Steve wrote, and it will go through, it's for Windows, uh, or you can run Wine on Linux and run it. Uh, it will go through, and it's got a, a, a knowledge of a whole slew of, of DNS servers that are out there and publicly accessible. And he will go through, and he will perform various benchmarking tests on all of them, and he will then render a list of DNS servers you can get to uh, by how long it takes for them to reserve query, resolve queries from your location. So you can see uh, uh, there's a lot going on here. There's this little blue circle symbol. Some of these guys are amber. Some of these guys are blue. There's this little red stuff. These all mean things. These three different colors here mean things. And I know what they are, but I don't want to 
spend 10 minutes to tell you. If you're interested, you can you can get Steve's software for free here and you can run it uh, and find out what DNS servers are nearby your house or your small business. Okay, so let's, uh, I mean, I think that's about what I want to say about how DNS actually works. I hope I've convinced you that it's very important. Um, all of the internet activity that you would do has to wait while DNS queries are waiting to resolve. And there is, this is just the eBay front page. That's all I loaded here. And you can see this absolutely spectacular number of resolutions that had to be done. And the same thing is going to be true. By the way, this Wireshark that I'm using, this is very easy to use software. Go and download it and, and, and use it if you don't already. Um, and that is the best way to learn about a lot of these protocols. You can see just spectacular spectacular numbers of DNS queries. And the whole time that these are going on, um, whatever that was that you need that query for to load, you're going to be sitting there and waiting until that until that goes. Now, even though these only take a couple of dozen milliseconds apiece probably to resolve, you know, you multiply that by this number of queries, and a lot of that time that uh, you're waiting for your page to load is actually because you're on DNS, uh, you know, you're waiting on some DNS queries to go through. Okay? So let's see what else I have here for you. Uh, over here on the free on the uh, free NAS forums, where you can find me, uh, I have a configuration file right in here that you can cut and paste for your own DNS server. That I'm going to show you how to install. Okay. So hopefully, uh, I've I've convinced you that this is interesting stuff, and maybe I've convinced you that, like me, you might want to run your own um, DNS server. Okay, you know, how much performance increase will you see? I don't know. A little bit, a lot. It depends upon how good the default DNS that uh, you're getting from your ISP is. But I tell you what, it is very educational. It's fun to do. So even if you don't get that much performance increase, it's still a fun thing to do. And, um, well, let me just go ahead and start uh, installing a DNS server in my free NAS uh, FreeBSD jacket. Okay, so there are a number of DNS servers out there, okay. a whole bunch of them. And here on Wikipedia is the comparison of DNS server software. And uh, I'll go through and tell you about uh, how some of these work. Uh, there's about three or four big players. Uh, Bind, which is the Berkeley Internet Name Domain, service, I think. Uh, this has been around for a long time, um, at least since, what, the 80s, early 80s. Uh, believe it or not, before there was DNS, this, all this stuff was accomplished by people exchanging these hosts files, so that's kind of an interesting bit of history, but Bind was kind of the first and is still sort of the, the heavy lifter of the DNS universe. It, Bind is to DNS what Apache is to web servers, okay? Um, other players that are important, there's PowerDNS is an important player. Uh, MaraDNS is, you know, interesting. Uh, Unbound is my personal favorite, and that's the one we're going to be installing today. DNS Mask is very popular. You'll find that uh, is the default DNS resolver um, in uh, PFSense, which is a, a type of roll-your-own-router software. Uh, it's also part of some of those firmwares for your routers, like uh, Tomato and, and guys like that. Uh, DNS Mask also includes um, DHCP in, as well. So there are quite a few players out here. There are, um, of course, there's Microsoft DNS, and then there are these guys down here, uh, Nominum, and uh, they are... Uh, expensive commercial um, DNS resolvers. And they each have their, their own sort of quirks and difficulties of installation. The one to me, Unbound, I choose Unbound for two reasons. Unbound is extremely uh, conservative on its resource usage, and it's extremely good performance. It is appropriate for the smallest of the smallest uh, DNS server installations. Uh, and it's appropriate for larger enterprise installations also, okay? And it has most of the uh, 
modern features of DNS. In fact, a lot of things are, are moving away from bind these days and are going to be moving onto unbound. In fact, the PFSense software that I mentioned earlier, which is kind of like a power user's uh, router, that is moving from uh, from DNS mask up to unbound. Okay, so unbound is unbound.net. You can read all the documentation here. Uh, I'm not going to spoil the fun for you and tell you too much about um, all the different things you can do, um, but we will talk about a little bit of it. Um, oh yes, uh, DNS sec. One problem with DNS is that, uh, I say problem in quotes, DNS has a, a fairly interesting and fairly large attack surface. So some sophisticated uh, security threats on the internet are based upon, uh, you know, a, the spoofing of DNS packets, um, the interception of DNS packets, the, the changing of the contents of DNS packets. Well, the DNS security extensions, so DNS sec, which Unbound can do. I will not show you how to do that. If you need, if you feel that you need that, uh, you can learn about it yourself. But DNS sec will allow you to have authentication uh, using public key cryptography on the answers that you get from your DNS servers out there on the internet or you know, on your own uh, DNS server that you're running in your own place. Okay? So you can read about that if you want to. Now, why would you want that? Okay. Generally speaking, you know, uh, it's not usually necessary for the average user to be too concerned about the DNS sec. There are a lot of security paranoid people out there um, who just like to use it. But generally speaking, it, it doesn't affect, it, it's not something that most of us are going to need. However, there are people out there with ISPs who do all kinds of, of really vicious stuff to DNS. Cyberjock, who is one of our most famous guys from the Freenas uh, community. Cyberjock has a rural ISP provider. And this particular ISP provider intercepts any UDP traffic on port 53, any DNS, no matter what you set it for, no matter what DNS server you look for, his ISP snags it, and it rewrites the answer to include um, things that are financially profitable for that particular ISP. And so that's the worst kind of abuse, and there is no way to stop it unless you get in their face with this DNS security extension. So if you have a case like that, and you're just philosophically against your ISP pulling a job like that on you, well, then you can use this. But if you have one of these large ISPs, you have Verizon Fios, or, or you have Comcast, or you have something like that in the United States, this will usually not be something that they're pulling on you. Okay, so how to install the Unbound um, DNS server. First of all, Unbound is available on basically any platform you can think of. I'm going to be installing it on a free NAS, uh, free BSD jail. So this is what I'm going to show you is correct for free BSD. Uh, there are analogous installs uh, for your, whatever your package system is for your particular operating system, and I, I assume you're smart enough to handle that. But in the case of free NAS and free BSD, you need to make sure that you have Download of the ports tree. So in order to download the ports tree, you do port snap fetch extract. I've already done that, so I'm not going to do it again. Um, before you do anything, you should do a port snap fetch update. You can see that my ports tree is already up to date. And if you go to um, user local, uh, excuse me, if you go to uh, why am I? user ports, if you go to user ports, there is a subtree called DNS. And um, basically, all of these uh, DNS servers that you saw here, you're gonna you're gonna be able to find them over here. For example, you like Mara DNS? Well, check it out. Mara DNS is right in here. You like um, DNS Mask? DNS Mask is right here. Uh, we like Unbound. Okay. So I'm gonna go into the Unbound directory, and the way that you install this is simply make install clean. Okay, and we'll have a, a couple of uh, questions to answer about what we want to do. Let me just give you a quick rundown on this. So I'm going to pause right now and tell you, my target here is a small uh, office, 
or home user. Okay. So I'm going to make some decisions here which are correct for a modest DNS requirement. If you have lots of users doing lots of activity in a larger enterprise environment, do not do this. Okay, but ostensibly, you you know, if you're if you're the IT guy in a large enterprise like that, and you need to watch my video. Well, you got you got a whole other set of problems you're going to have to deal with. So, uh, for most of you, you can just do what I'm going to show you how to do here. Um, all of this, you know, all of these SSL related things, of course, are for the DNS sec. You can put that on there. You can you can install the docs if you want to. Of course, there's plenty of docs over here at the uh, unbound.net website. So you don't have to do that if you don't want to. I'm going to take it off. Uh, lib event. Let me tell you what this is. The event handlers that are built into FreeBSD can only really handle... Uh, so let me just calculate this. Uh, da, 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 da. I guess you're only going to be able to get about 900 or so. About 900... Um, sort of outstanding requests are going to be handleable here. If you're going to have more than that, which which you might in a large enterprise, uh, you need to install a higher performance event handler, um, which can do that for you. Okay. Um, but I'm not going to need that for this. And let me explain to you why. If you go back and you look at um, and you look at this Wireshark output, and you see how many queries you could have outstanding at any given moment. So here you got one, two, three, four, five, six. You've got six there that are outstanding, and then they start getting resolved later here. And you look again, you see how many, here's four that are outstanding, you know. You look, and a, a single user doing his own thing, it's usually only going to have about half a dozen at worst outstanding at any given moment. Um, it turns out that the worst I've ever seen one user generate by normal activities is about 25. So you can get as high as 25, okay? So uh, let's go back to this. So before I was telling you, you can have maybe eight or 900 going with the standard event handler. Obviously, you know, 25 is a worst case scenario. You got five or 10 or 20 users. You're not even remotely near that kind of a cutoff. And even if for some reason you got to that kind of cutoff once in a very great, you know, while, Unbound has a way of handling that. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So generally speaking, you don't need to put a special event handler in there, but it's here if you're going to be a large enterprise user. Uh, these you can you can look and you can look up if you if you want on these we don't need these um, threading support generally speaking we are going to run ownbound on a single thread if you have a, a heavy duty server that has more going on you're going to want to run multi threaded I'm going to leave the threading support on there um, just in case you might want to play with it it won't you know leaving it on there won't really affect much uh, in terms of uh, our performance or, or or the other aspects to this build. So I'm just going to leave it on there even though we're not going to use it. So it's going to uh, download the files and a couple of dependencies that it's going to need. I never need this native language support, so I take it off usually. So this will take, you know, about a minute to build. And when it's done building, the only things we really have to do, uh, I'll show you where the files reside, and I'll show you where the configuration file is. Um, and I'll run through some of the options for you uh, so you can know what they are. Uh, LDNS is a uh, library that does a lot of DNS, um, that does a lot of DNS uh, calls uh, in support of own cloud. So you, or excuse me, in support of unbound. So you're going to need to put that in. Okay. And so this should be almost done at this point. And so once this is done, it's just a simple matter of, of uh, showing you how Unbound actually works, how to set up the configuration file, how to set up the control. Uh, there's a, a, a controller that goes with Unbound that is very easy to set up, and I'll show you exactly how all that works. 
<laughs> and then finally, at the end of the video, I will show you, I'll give you some idea of how you can set the computers in your home to use the DNS server that you've set up. Now, why is that important? Well, remember before, you know, how the cached answer took only a couple of milliseconds as opposed to hundreds of milliseconds. Well, if every user in your house is using the DNS server, then when user A asks for, for a certain DNS query, uh, it goes in the cache. And then when user B, who had nothing to do with user A on some other computer elsewhere in the enterprise or the house, asks for the same answer, he will be able to take advantage of your earlier queries. So that's kind of nice. Okay, so we are installed here. The location in FreeBSD for the unbound stuff, for the configuration stuff, is here in user local Etsy unbound. I don't believe that's where it is in Linux or anything else, so you'll have to figure out where that is. You get this one file called unbound.com.sample, which shows what all of the configurable options are and what their default settings are. Um, I guess we should go through that real quick. I won't spend much time telling you about this stuff. You can read about it as much as you want, but let me give you a few pointers. Uh, Verbosity uh, will accept several numbers here. It goes from zero, I think it goes up to four or five. Uh, just a little word to the wise. Um, one is about the highest practical number you can go to. Anything higher than one is almost a debug level of log. And the, and the log that you get will be obscenely large. Okay. So that's something to think about. Uh, I don't recommend putting that above one. Um, statistics are reported in your log at the intervals that you specify. Okay. Those statistics can either be per hour or they can be cumulative over the time the daemon's been running. So you can set that here. Extended statistics add uh, a number of sort of power user statistics to, to what is reported. However, when you turn it on, there is a very, very slight performance hit, uh, which you won't notice if you're just running a small installation. Here's where you could set your multi-threading. Okay. Uh, yeah. Port 53 is, is not only the classic port, but you're actually in for a world of pain if you try to do DNS on another port, especially on Windows. So you probably don't want to touch that. Uh, outgoing. <laughs> 4096. I don't even think it could do that if you wanted it to. Um, you can read what, what that's all about here. In my configuration file, we're going to find that this number is set much lower. Um, yeah, I could tell you what all this stuff is. Let me, let me just summarize this stuff in this region by telling you that uh, there are tweakables in Unbound, and you know, a lot of a lot of power users like like you and like me, maybe uh, we like to just, on the principle of the matter, sort of tweak these things to be super ideal um, for our particular installs. That's the kind of thing that this is, uh, but it's really not gonna it's not gonna make that much of a difference. It's not even worth your time to tweak it. I would just recommend leaving it right there. Um, this stuff here is all protocol related. Uh, it's sort of advanced. Protocol Voodoo. Um, the, a good rule of thumb is, is is if I have to explain to you what these kinds of things like like this mean, or like what this means here, if I have to explain that to you, then you definitely don't want to mess with it. So that's the kind of thing you might want to educate yourself on if you want to. Here's where you can set how much memory will be set aside to remember all those answers that we were talking about. Here's your number of queries per thread, 1,024. Um, it turns out that number's going to be a little bit too too big, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here's where you can turn on or off IPv4 and IPv6 sockets. Um, if you're wondering about UDP and TCP, uh, DNS is, is traditionally run on UDP. The problem with UDP is that, you know, there is uh, no ability to make sure that packets arrive. There's no ability really to see if the packet has any errors in it. And typically speaking, that's not a problem. It's certainly not a problem for us when we're asking for DNS queries on our own land. But if you're out there and you've got a dodgy internet connection and you have problems accessing a DNS resolver, uh, you can use TCP, which, which is slower, but offers uh, error checking and other sort of um, uh, 
you know, and, and other, and other parts of that protocol to make sure that your packets are arriving correctly. But it is slower. Typically, uh, you won't need to use that. Okay. Um, you can also set who is allowed to ask your DNS for queries. Okay. You can set that there. Uh, typically, um, you 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 de-escalate your privileges when you're running a daemon like this. Uh, when you install Unbound on FreeBSD, automatically this Unbound user is created for you. Okay, and so that's who you want to run this as. Uh, also, the log file. I recommend, and it's a, this is personal taste, but I recommend that you do not use the system log. If you set this to no, then all of the log information from DNS, from, from your Unbound DNS, will go to an unbound.log file um, in in this directory. Okay? The times in the log can either be Unix epic times or they can be you know human readable times. You set that there. Um, root hints, man, I could talk for two hours on what root hints are. Uh, don't worry about it. How about that answer? Don't worry about it. Um, oh, here, maybe you guys can give something back to me. Uh, I don't have the foggiest idea what this does, this target fetch policy. Over the past year, I have read this blurb a thousand times. I have tried different settings. I've tried to find someone that has explained this correctly somewhere on the internet, and I just cannot. So I am not sure exactly what this does. What I am sure of is that I appear to get the best performance in my use case when I set all those numbers to zero. So, if you would like to uh, tell me what the, if you know exactly what these are, please don't guess. You know, if you do know exactly what this means, I would love to know. Uh, so you could tell me if you figure it out. Um, a lot of this stuff down here is for the DNS security stuff. Um, prefetch. Prefetch is interesting. I like to turn it on. What prefetch does is when it looks in its you know, it's cache, it's remembered answers of the DNS, and it sees that uh, one of the entries that you tend to use a lot is going to expire soon. Um, what what Unbound will do is it will just sort of preemptively ask the DNS question again for that host and put it back in the cache before you need it. That's called a prefetch. Okay, that, gener that increases the amount of DNS queries you're going to make from your server by about 10%. But in my opinion, it's, it's well worth it. So I usually turn that on. Minimal responses is, is interesting. When, remember when we were doing dig, we got a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of answers, but the only part of the answer we really needed was the actual IP address, um, to get to our, our website. If you want to, for any reason, um, cause Unbound to only respond with the minimum necessary information to resolve DNS addresses, then ostensibly you can set that to yes. Uh, Unbound can do two things. It can it can be a validator or an iterator. For the purposes that we're going to use, we're only going to use it as an iterator. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, show you that in the um, in the sample configuration file that I have. Uh, yeah. You can read about all of these guys if you want to. Cache size, local zone, wow, a lot of stuff there. There's some Python stuff. Oh, remote control, we're going to set that up. I will explain that to you in just one moment. And the forward zones. The forward zones, this is where you are going to put the DNS servers on the Internet that you are going to use to get your authoritative answers from. Okay. And I will show you exactly how all of that works. Okay, so now what I need to do is I need to take uh, my let's see what was that? Dr. Cake Base Guide. Okay, so if you go to the Freenance forms and you go up into their little search box and you put Dr. KK DNS like this, um, you're going to get this post, and in this post, I have a sample uh, unbound.com file that you can use. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut and paste and just copy that in. We are going to, let's do an old trick from the old school. 
We're going to use cat redirected to unbound.com. We're going to uh, paste. And we have control D as in dog. And that should give us our unbound comp file. Uh, I think what I'd like to do here. Yes. What I'm going to do is I, do I have a, I think I have a, Good. Let's see. Shown. Um, unbound. Unbound. This directory. So what I've done there is I have made this directory the property of the unbound user and this configuration file property of the unbound user. Okay. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do the unbound control setup. Okay. That's it. Unbound control setup gives me um, gives me a couple of cryptographically related files here that is going to allow me to control my unbound server using a, a special utility that they have. Okay, so why don't we start the server and see what happens? Okay, so we're going to do service unbound one stop. Okay, that's it. Unbound is running using the configuration file that I provided. Now, maybe we can just take a look here. This is a very, very, very lightweight group of settings. I have made a very lightweight and very agile caching DNS server that we're going to use. And why am I so interested in lightweight? Well, I'm a free BSD uh, user with ZFS, the ZFS file system for my free NAS. The ZFS file system performs the best when it has the maximum amount of RAM and other system resources available to it. So, you know, most people don't have to worry about 100 megabytes of RAM being blown away here or, or, or uh, 200 sockets blown away here. I do have to worry about that. That does affect the performance of my file system. So I go for, for all of my little demons here, I go for the minimalistic configuration. So you can see that this is a lot shorter, of course, than the, um, than the sample file because I'm only setting certain uh, certain parameters. Interface all zeros means that it will answer any it'll answer on any interface that it hears from. Okay, you can see this line here allows me to, uh, and you'll have to change this possibly for your setup. Uh, my LAN in my house is on this particular subnet. Uh, it's probably also the case for you, but if it's not, then you probably know, so just change it accordingly. You can see I've set the verbosity to 1. I've set the statistics interval to 1 hour. I'm using cumulative statistics. Uh, the outgoing range is only 256. That's more than enough for, for a house. One thread, uh, one megabyte of, um, of message cache. Here's two megabytes of resource record cache. You can read about exactly what that means, but this is where your answers are going to be stored. I handle up to 128 queries on one thread. That is more than enough for any conceivable situation in a house or a small business. Um, I've turned off IPv6. I've turned off TCP. My log file is going to be unbound.log. I do not want to use the system log. I want to use human readable formats. Um, I won't explain what this does. Um, just trust me. Um, log queries, no. If you said log queries equal to yes, then what you're going to see is every query that every user of your DNS server makes. Um, you know, so it'll say this IP address wanted to know what eBay.com is. Well, you can imagine that your log file is going to be humongous if you set that to yes, but you can if you want to. Uh, here's my target fetch policy that I mentioned before. I've said it's all zeros. Prefetch is on. Um, no matter how long someone says they want their DNS answer to last, I never want it to be longer than this. Uh, that's pro I don't know what that is, a week? Maybe that's a week. And I only need the iterator. Here is the very interesting uh, forward zones that I was talking about. These four that I am using, and you should have about two. You can put three or four if you want to, um, but you should always have two. These are the places that if my server does not know the answer, these are the people I will ask. Okay, these are publicly available DNS servers. I can hit all of these in under 25 milliseconds. Okay, so that's pretty good. I'm over here on the east coast of the United States. If you're not, 
then you probably don't want to use these servers. So I suggest that you use a, um, an appropriate utility like the one that Steve Gibson had to determine what are fast, good public DNS servers that you can get to. Okay, and this little blurb down here allows me uh, to use that remote control. Okay, so that's what goes into my configuration file. So if you do unbound control, okay, these are the various things you can do. You can start and stop, you can reload, you can look at the stats, you can actually look at the cache. There's probably nothing in the cache right now, right? Yes, there's nothing in the cache, but watch this. Um, Okay, maybe that wasn't too smart. Let's try that again. What is my IP address here? It's uh, 192.168.159.4. So let's, let's do that. 168.159.4. Okay, let's see. Okay. I've just asked for this unbound server that we've set up to give me the information on eBay. Of course, it didn't know uh, what eBay was because it doesn't know anything yet. So it asked one of those four servers that I had at the bottom of my configuration file, and this is the answer. Now, if you go to unbound control and you go to dump cache, you are going to see that dump cache now knows all of these answers, and these answers are good for this many seconds. If I dump cache again, by the way, you'll see that that number has decreased by 10 seconds because it's been 10 seconds uh, since I since I did that, okay? All right, so that's how that works. If we're convinced that everything is working well, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this off. I'm going to set the service to be on. So unbound and able will be yes. Now that I've done that, this service will always start in this jail every time it starts. So service unbound start. And that's it. I am now running Unbound. If you take a look, by the way, there's Unbound. Look at it, just loafing along with just a little bit of RAM usage. Okay, that's exactly what we want. Okay, and in terms of efficiency, by the way, you see it says 0% CPU. Um, you will never in your life see this number go above 0.00% CPU. Unbound is so lightweight that you will hardly even know that it's doing anything in terms of CPU. It's totally totally lightweight okay and that's it now i have an unbound server running so we're almost done with this video um let me uh show you uh how it looks in the real world um here is my server and here's from uh, my logs from about uh I don't know, this is about a week ago now it's uh, around thanksgiving so this is about a week ago and these are taking a two to at, at two consecutive hours this is at 7 24 in the morning um, yeah, and here's 6.24 in the morning and 7.24 in the morning. Not much going on in my house at 6.24 and 7.24. In fact, probably nobody is awake, right? But take a look at this unbound information here. You can see at 6.24, this is how many queries my unbound server um, has answered for DNS. Of these 428,000, 268,000 were answers that I already knew, and so they were instantly served up. 160,000 of them we did not know, and we had to go recurse out to one of those other servers. Okay, and you can see I've got about 10,000 prefetched here. See that? Now this is a, this is about right. If you you expect if you have things set up correctly, you expect generally this number to be about two thirds of the total. And I think we could probably do the math and convince ourselves that it was in the vicinity of two-thirds of the total. Okay? Now you can see an hour later, an hour later, there's been 400 queries. Now nobody is awake. Nobody is awake and there's 400 queries. And why is that? All the cell phones are doing stuff. The television, the smart TV is doing stuff. The router's doing stuff. All kinds of stuff is doing DNS all the time. So in that time, about what is that? About 400 more queries were done, and you can see uh, about half of those were in the cache and half were not. Okay. And other inf interesting information you can see here: 29. 29 is is the maximum depth of the request list that I had. So I have it at one time since I was running the server 
up to 29 things ready to, re- you know, 29 things outstanding to resolve at any given time. That is way, way, way less than the 256 or whatever we had the server configured for. So you can see that none of the queries were unserviceable. If you, if you, if you exceed what your server can do, the jostle and the exceeded will start climbing. Okay. But you can see we didn't have any problems at all. At any given moment, there were 0.63 queries waiting to be resolved. Okay. And if you do the math, uh, if you do the math, that's a sensible, that's a fairly sensible number. Okay. Uh, when it had to go out there on the internet to get an answer, it took an average of 63 milliseconds. Okay. But that includes these ridiculous outliers that you can see down here. So this list here is a breakdown of, of where this number came from. Um, in reality, when you look at these quartile numbers here, this here is the median. So 50th percentile time was 23 milliseconds. So if you have this number here at 30 milliseconds or less, you're doing about as good as anybody can do on the planet for DMS. Okay. So we're doing a pretty good job here. You can see how the times uh, break down in this histogram. Okay. Okay. And basically that is how, it, that's how you set up a DNS server. Now, in order to actually use it, okay, that depends upon what kind of a, a system you're using. Uh, in the case of, uh, Uh, in the case of FreeBSD, Etsy slash resolve.com, and I think that's the same for Linux. I actually never used Linux, so I don't know, you know, where anything is there. Um, but I think it is the same in Linux. This will tell you what your, what your DNS is. It's, it's this guy that's after name server. Okay. So you would just go into this file. You would replace this IP address with the fixed IP that you have for your unbound, uh, your unbound DNS server. You put it right in there. In the case of FreeNAS itself, so where was that? In the case of FreeNAS itself, you'll be able to make these settings over here uh, in network. Uh, in the network, you can set specific IP addresses that are going to be the resolve your query. So whatever this guy was, this guy was, I believe, 192.168.159.4 is the actual IP address of my, yes, you can see it right here. So I could, I could set that right in here in the case of FreeNAS, okay? In the case of Windows, okay? So here's that Windows VM I was talking about. If you go and you open up your network properties, And you go to your uh, adapter settings, right click on this, do your properties. Okay, you will find that you have IP version 4. If you go ahead and you look at the properties on that, hello, look at this. Okay, so if you set it for obtain DNS server automatically, then your router will tell it what to use, and that will probably be your ISP's uh, DNS address. By the way, you can override that. Usually in your router, you can set a fixed DNS address to be whatever you want. And then anybody that is connecting uh, to your router from the inside will be told to use that DNS. So you can change it there. That, of course, is probably what you want to do. Um, but for, for a given computer, you can always manually configure it right here, okay, for, for Windows. Okay, well, that's basically how DNS works. I hope I've you know, whetted your appetite for maybe learning a little bit more and doing your own research. Um, you can run uh, Unbound in a in a jail in FreeBSD or in, in your Linux server or whatever you want to do. It's very, very lightweight. It will provide uh, your own DNS resolution and caching on your end. And uh, it's certainly interesting to set up and you may see a performance enhancement. So in any case, you can find me uh, on IRC in the FreeNAS channel. Um, you can also find me in the free NAS forums, and uh, I'm happy to help. And I and I do take requests for any kind of a tutorial or or a video on a particular type of software that you might want to install. So hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you on the next video.